Hello, welcome to day two of the Out of Control Dog Summit. Today is all about dogs that are reactive to people and other dogs. I know this is a huge one and probably a, a large reason or, or primary reason why a lot of you are here. Uh, we had a lot of fun yesterday answering questions. There was a ton of participation. We're going to try to be slightly more succinct in our responses today, but we do want to you know, we want to answer questions thoroughly and neither Ian and I or I are known for our brevity. Um, hello, Ian. Say hello to everybody. Hi, Kelly. How are How you? you doing? And are you getting a delay on me today? No. Let's go okay, back. So and I don't forth. have to do. No, you don't have to do I'm that. I'm going to say something. Okay. Hello. You're supposed to say Is that something. Hello back, to me. It? Oh, yes. sorry. Yeah, I thought you were saying hello to everyone. Oh no, I, I heard. Back and forth. There's no okay, delay all right. today at all. It seems better today. All right, I think yes. we should jump right in. Because we have a lot of questions. I'm going to try to do it without my glasses today because I'm vain and the reflection was bothering me yesterday, but I'm guessing I'm going to end up with them back on. All right, first question of today. Ooh, let's see. This is from Amy. Here I go. That didn't last long. Um, my Dachshund Spaniel mix is very anxious around new people, but absolutely hates it when strangers come into our home. She will bark incessantly and sometimes try to grab their pant legs. Do you have any advice? So not comfortable around the door. So there's a lot to unpack here. I'll start and then hand it over to Ian. I think that was a good way to go yesterday. Um, Ian, unless you want to pipe in first. Um, you know, there's more, there's more than one thing going on, right? If your dog is anxious around new people, well, that's something we certainly would like to try to resolve. Because imagine, imagine going, you know, around life having that kind of anxiety. People are everywhere. And if you really don't like strangers and they come into your home, well, that would be kind of, that would be terrifying, I would think. Um, you know, barking um, and grabbing pant leg. I mean, that, you know, is she, is she being forward? Is that forward fear? Is she actually just really overexcited and aroused? I mean, you say she's anxious, I believe you. Um, one thing to do, and Ian, I'm sure we'll go into bigger detail, greater detail, is, you know, to try to, you know, um, help her feel more comfortable around strangers, and we'll get into that in a minute. And then the other thing is to give her something else to do when people come over to your home. I mean, first of all, she doesn't have to be there. She doesn't have to be present when strangers are there. You can put her quietly in another room, especially while you're retraining and trying to build her confidence. Don't throw her right into the mix where she has no options or feels defensive. Um, at the very least, you can give her a spot, a place to go, or a toy to grab, some kind of activity that she can proactively do um, that gives her, you know, gives her purpose, gives her focus, and hopefully keeps her calm. So I do like them going to their mats and staying, and you first practice this without strangers, obviously. We have a whole um, subtle series for that at the Dunbar Academy, and um, I do believe that we talk about that in some of the uh, lectures over this week as well. Um, grabbing a toy, once the mouth is full, can't really bark, and she can't really grab a pant leg. Um, you know, it's giving her some kind of some kind of relief. So you want her to feel better, but you also want to give her something to do. And in the meantime, try to avoid her being maybe even out at all with strangers, but definitely not when they first come in. If she can be quietly on her mat or in a crate or behind a baby gate where she can suss out the situation without having to be in the thick of it, that would be helpful. Ian, what would you like to say? Um, well, first, I would think let's be a little more realistic and natural, you know, and considering the dog's way, the dog's point of view, the dog's feelings. It is so unnatural for a dog to meet strangers, whether other dogs or people. I mean, that's the whole point of socialization, where when they're puppies, they are universally accepting and approaching of all, all people, all dogs, so that we make the unfamiliar till they've met them, the familiar in adulthood. So, and this is very adaptive. That's why we, you know, they get used to mum and their litter mates in the den. When they start to emerge from the den, they run back in the den because whoever's out there, they don't know. It's probably so, so we know this. So to prevent it, we need heavy duty environmental enrichment and socialization well prior to 12 weeks. 
So how do we deal with this? Well, I wouldn't let strangers come to the house without first putting the dog away. What we want to try and do with the dog is one by one, create a core social group of people that the dog trusts, starting with family first and then frequent visitors. And we'll deal with that in, in the ways you've described. Ding dong, ding dong, when you say to the dog, hey, go to your bed or in your crate, and here's a Kong stuff with food, settle down. And But now you're paying attention to the dog, not the visitors, to keep the dog settled down and chewing. And um, then you let these strangers, then they come straight back, and you do the same thing again. So you take the Kong away, and then ding dong, ding dong, you put the Kong on the bed, go to your bed. And you have about six yeah. Uh -huh. And so you're establishing this core social group of people who are no longer strangers. They're people who are well. Then it means, hey, it's Kong time again, you know. And so that is, I think, the best way to go about it, whether the dog is, is scared of people or scared of dogs. That the natural way is they had a very well-known core you know, social group. And that's what you work with. And so that now when family and friends come to the house, the dog is cool. And if it is a stranger, you're getting audited or something, just put the dog in a different room. Unless that stranger is willing to work with you and do a few re-entries. Yes, very. All, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you really can't have a lot of success with. And it is best to not work, you know, train in traffic when you, when you, when you do so. Meaning don't start. At the or don't make it you no know, don't don't do it in the situation do it in other situations first and um, I'm going to take a little break here for a moment because I did not mention our sponsors our lovely sponsors and we I'm so excited to get to questions that I, I just don't jump in too soon um, we have so many cool sponsors we have Doggy Dan and you're going to hear from him this week he's really lovely to talk to and um, just a, a very very wonderful warm person and Ness Ness Jones who is doing separation anxiety I know a lot of you out there have separation anxiety issues and I know that this has been particularly challenging with the coming out of COVID times as well so Ness is here to support us for that there's also the healing vet so any kind of holistic vet needs um, you've got you know the healing vet which is has you know been graciously offered to sponsor us and polypets as well thank you to polypets um we couldn't do this without all of you and you know we've, we're offering all this great information and we're able to do that uh for free because we have lovely sponsors so there we go next question please all right also um i do want to say ian um diane hammond says very briefly uh on day one you said no one knows who you are um, I think that you did that probably in the uh, panel. And um, she says, your book, How to Teach a New Dog Old Tricks, has seen me through four puppies and is brilliant. I've gifted it, gifted it to many friends getting a new dog. So just a little kind thing to say there. So, thank There's nothing like the panel one. A single example yeah. <laughs> is wonderful. Yeah. Not bad. At least, you know, lots of dogs. Yeah. Um, Good feedback. All right, so let's see. My mixed breed dog starts nipping at my feet anytime I run. This behavior also extends when somebody else sprints or runs out in front of him. Advice, he has six breeds in him. Oh, you know them. Okay, Pitbull, Husky, um, Australian Cattle Dog, GS and Rot. Um, GS, what is GS? No, GSP, GSD, probably. and Shepherd probably. Okay, Joel, that would make sense with the two. So Pitbull, Husky, Cattle dog, German Shepherd, and Rottweiler. That is quite a dog. I bet he's really, really pretty dog. All right. So advice for nipping and um, you know chasing behavior when when with movement. Ian, you're you directing it to me. Yeah. Well, out of the the breeds, to me, I, I seldom look at breeds and looking at them. It's only the you know Orcados, the cattle dog, with the you know was bred to chase uh any moving object and nip at its heels i mean they're healers and so to me i just treat it as it's a dog problem and nipping at feet is not cool that the dog can get into a lot of trouble that way so i would probably 
start with um, the dog stationary. And so a downstay if you have one, if not, put the dog in the crate and then get him used to you moving around, say, your living room and do it outside in your yard. And I would do it one step at a time that it's like when you're reward, weight and reward training, say, walking on a, a loose leash, you stand still until the dog sits. Then you take one step. And when you do that, the dog explodes. That's how much one step, you know, excites and amps up a dog. So don't take two or three. You know, it's like you're always walking the razor edge. So get your dog still. Um, I would say sit at heel because you obviously want to move forward. And then when he's sitting, I would take one very slow step and stand still again. And the dog, you know, to take hold of your trousers or what have you, sit is the instruction or the punishment if you want the guidance you know i prefer those words sit heal and then we take another step and then another now we go two at a time three at a time now comes along the heavy duty praise this is what everyone misses if you look at people's reactions people's reactivity and people's verbal feedback most of the time they ignore the dog and all the good behavior it's throwing out. And then we highlight, you know, when the dog misbehaves. Um, and this is especially important when the misbehaviors are like a split second. And then we're like, no, no, get off, get off, get off. And, you know, if we interviewed the dog, it'd probably say, oh, my owner is so boring. But the one thing I can do to get it to be animated is just grab hold of her clothing and tug it. So we got to do it very slowly, one step at a time, knowing that you can't take two, you can't take three. You will then be out of control of your dog. So I would just uh, work and say, well, let's teach the basic, good old, old fashioned heel. Can I say something? No, well, I just, okay. I don't know if you're frozen or, or if you're waiting for me. I think you're frozen. Am I frozen? Oh dear. Oh dear. Well, I don't know if it, he's frozen. Okay, so I'm not frozen, hopefully. All right, so um, <laughs> that's my opportunity. So when a dog is outwardly seeking and is trying to control the environment, uh, as you know, these types of dogs are, he's hurting basically. Um, so what you what you want to do is let your dog look into the environment but then pay attention and look for these signals that your dog is alerting to something or has zoned in on something right so you're going to get you know you have happy relaxed dog face going and then they go mouth closes ears go up and they might freeze a little bit and that is the time to react. Watch your dog for reactions and don't wait until they're already reacting, right? So um, you, you see that reaction and you're going to call, you're going to mark your dog, say, good dog, look at that, you know, come here. Oh, look, look at that cookie dog is what Ian likes to say. Um, or yeah, nice dog. And then reward them. They're going to turn to you. Um, what you want to do is Notice your dog's emotions changing and then acknowledge that their emotions are changing by saying something to them. And then when you say something to them, they're going to look at you and you're going to reward them. And you have to start at a distance, obviously, with this. You don't do this you know, on a busy bike path. You, know, you might be out in a field or something. But basically, what you want is when the dog is getting that emotion, whether it's excitement, anger, fear, you know, pure joy, whatever it may be, or just in inherently needs to chase, what you want to do is make that emotion become a cue to look at you to, for what to do next. And once you've got their attention, you can reward them for turning away from the thing. You can ask them to do something else. You can move them away. And um, you can, you'll find that you can, you can over time change their response basically by, um, by doing this repeatedly, but you do have to pay attention. People tend to wait too long. They're like, oh, well, it's coming. You know, they maybe don't notice the first signals and then suddenly the dog is, you know, rah, 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 or, or chasing. And I would say a dog like this should not be off leash 
um, in places where you're expecting people to be running by like a park or something like that um, until you've worked on this. You, you should definitely have a long line or a leash or something so that they, you know, the dog can't nip at people. Um, and then you can practice this in your home, as Ian said, you know, there's, you know, there's healing control, there's, um, you know, to no such control, there's get your toy instead, there's look at me, you know, all these different things you can do instead. Okay, so um, now we go. That was, Ian's back. I think he's not frozen, make a face or something. Ian, put your thumb up. Are you frozen again? Oh, okay, it was hard to tell. All right, we lost you there for a second. Next question. Uh, my Corgi has several unavoidable bad experiences with other dogs. He is now understandably very reactive to other dogs, but not all dogs. Is there hope of him learning to ignore difficult dogs? So it sounds like maybe when you're saying difficult dogs, it's dogs that are pushy and coming into his space, is my guess, or maybe running dogs because he is a Corgi and not unlike the last dog we talked about, he might want to control big, moving or exuberant dogs uh, and be fine with calmer dogs. So it's hard to say exactly. But yes, and honestly, you know, the, you, you, first of all, your dog doesn't have to like every other dog they meet, you know, and their dog doesn't have to meet every dog that they pass. So there's that. Um, keep that in mind. That is huge, huge. Um, now, if, if a dog runs up to you, that's a different story. But you can teach your dog to ignore and stay with you. Come on, let's go. Walk, 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 heel, hand, hand target. Uh, let's jog over here. Um, things like that so that you can get them to ignore other dogs that are being obnoxious. Um, but also you can teach them to, um, you know, when they're, again, when they have that feeling, oh, this dog's annoying me, oh, I gotta chase it. I'm gonna look at my handler, I'm gonna look at my mom and, uh, and she's gonna tell me what to do next. And she's gonna reward me for that moment of self-control that I had. And now she's gonna help me out of this situation either by giving me some more space or giving me something to do or maybe all I needed was a moment and now we can do a sniff. Um, when your dog is meeting dogs, uh, I would say keep greetings short and sweet until you know whether it's a dog that your dog, I mean, sometimes you know, right? You know, for instance, I'll you. they're not gonna like that one. But if you don't know and you wanna do a greeting, a polite greeting, sniff, sniff, call your dog away and let give him a, give him a break. Don't let that sniff, sniff, sniff become more tense and, and until someone has to react. So keeping greetings short and sweet and doing maybe multiple greetings, um, short greetings, sniffing, sniffing, come back, sniffing, sniffing, come back. And then sometimes choosing to move on. You do not have to interact with every dog you pass. I'm not suggesting that you are doing that, but a lot of people do. They think the dog has to beat every dog. Um, and, and your dog is, it's okay if your dog says, I don't like this one. This one's you know up my bum or just too pushy or stepping on me, I'm a short corgi, and I'm gonna snap a little bit. And in that case, I would say, okay, let's. I'm gonna remove you from the situation, but not as a punishment. I'm gonna help you out. Let's go over here and do something else and talk to this other dog or go on our walk or play over here. Um, so, you know, I mean, okay, so you say, yes, it's stressy dogs, dogs that glare, that dogs are reacting to him. I mean, can you blame him, you know? Um, you know, he's trying to control the situation. And I think that that's, that's okay. You know, I mean, like, it, as long as he's not hurting anybody or going after anybody when they're ignoring him, I would say if, if someone gets in his face, it's okay to react, but then it's up to you to have your dog's back and advocate for him and get him out of there. And and then sometimes just say, no, thank you for training. You know, if, if you know that there's an obnoxious dog or a dog that's glaring at him, I would, I would avoid that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere near that personally, whenever possible. Ian? Um, well, yeah, following on your advice, um, I, I would teach, well, I like teaching all dogs on leash that the default thing to another dog is no greeting, it's you walk by. And the exercise of choice to do this in the shortest amount of time is concentric circles that I mentioned yesterday. And I think this should be an on leash exercise in every dog training class because this is what people want. And you basically have two concentric circles, one goes in one direction, one in the other, and you just keep walking. And the first lap or two or three, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, dogs are jumping, wrapping around their owner's legs, but by about the fourth or fifth lap, they learn, oh, these dogs just keep walking by. And say you had 10 oh. people in a class, so you've got five in each circle, 
every lap you walk by five dogs. Well, if you do 20 laps, there's a hundred walk bys you've practiced in about seven to eight minutes. And I, I would just have, I'm a great uh, favor as well as uh, one topic classes, the, you know, the concentric circle class where you come and you just walk by, walk by, walk. By. But my initial approach to any dog like this, dogs don't, you know, say, uh, get reactive to all dogs. No, dogs are just like us. They have special friends, special enemies, individual dogs. But if you don't do anything about it, it will generalize before you know it. And now the dog is reacting to all dogs. And so I would concentrate on the dogs it doesn't react to and just say, would you like to form a core social group with my dog? They need it. So desperately keep, you know, introducing this attitude that the dog should get on with all dogs and all people and be lovey-dovey, you know, is just absolutely non-dog. It's not the way dogs well, do it. It's not, it's not even human. I mean, no, we don't like everybody we meet and certainly don't, you know. Well, absolutely. So, and so I think humane thing you can do for a dog, especially in our insulated Western ways now, is make sure it has a core social group of people where he's totally relaxed, none of them are strangers, they're all friendly visitors, and a core social group of dogs that they walk with every day. And then after about six months, now you can start going to parks together. And you're going in with your friends and bodyguards, and it's much less stressful for dogs. Um, I'd like to point out a couple of things. Well, when you say every day, you mean frequently. It doesn't have to be every day, right? I mean, the more the, the, more, the better. I have a report is great. But I wanted to point it to everybody in, in these last couple of answers, Ian has said um, something that is that is useful in many, many, many scenarios, which is you practice the you've got to practice the pattern or the, or the behavior that you want outside of the work, right? So um, the concentric circle classes, for instance, are great because you're getting repetition. They're getting repetition without the stress. So the, the dog knows what to do already uh, and, and is, is used to the routine and has the skills without the stress so that when the stress comes in, you have something to fall back on. And, and that's the same for when you have someone coming and going from the, the front door with the doorbell. Um, and maybe you don't even start with the doorbell. People coming and going, but people that they know. And the repetition makes it less exciting, less, less novel. There's less energy amping up. And so that's something that is useful in lots of different scenarios. Okay, let's go to a new question. Let's see, my lab Luca is a 15 month strong male who loves other dogs and has no manners. So a typical lab, uh, just uncontrolled, especially adolescent lab, <laughs> uh, he is just uncontrollably excited, uh, excitable around them. Is it too late to pull things back and follow Holly's advice? Oh, heck no, no, it's not too late. Um, you, you, you just, you do have to take a step back. And sometimes that means abandoning your agenda or your perceived agenda for a while, or ch changing your agenda for a while. You know, maybe your dog doesn't need to go to the park and play with dogs and become more and more dog centric right now. Maybe you need to work on calming down and on engagement and other things. And that becomes your outing for a little while. It is, but you know, 15 months old, your dog is, you know, a lab at 15 months, this is how they act. Like that's part, that's textbook, you know? Um, so you're on track, at least it's friendly. So, you know, all you, you know, at least it's friendly behavior. All you have to do now is, you know, teach him to how to, how to behave, you know, etiquette, doggy canine etiquette and such. Ian, you have a lot of lab experience, rambunctious lab experience uh, these days. I think Something I must know, add. Luca. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think two things here, you know, following on from the troubleshooting, like concentric circles, we can do this one on one. You just need another owner and another dog. And it's not like uh, uncontrollable, excited Labradors are hard to find. So you invite them to any place and you walk in opposite directions. Then you come back past each other. Then you do that. Then you do that. Now, time. Now we can start stopping, saying, asking the dog to sit, but not letting them greet. And if you time 
long it takes you to get your dog to sit, how many commands you have to use, and you test that every trial, what you will now get is instant proof of training. The numbers don't lie. Now you're passing sits instantly. You know, at that point, I would then, if both owners agree, let the dogs say hello to each other on leash, or even better, off leash. So I think the two key things here in a lot of what I've found from these talks, a lot of advice is, um, let me give you the classic example, <clears throat> jumping up at the front door, running off and chasing tail. The answer is simple. Just instruct your dog to sit. It's pure and simple. If it sits, it can't do those things. Theoretically, it is sound, but it won't work in practice because your dog is over the top and out to lunch. It brain is not receiving it. And so you keep repeating the same procedure, but you keep track of the time it took or the number of commands you give. And you will find after about five to six repetitions, you get an enormous improvement. And then you start to perfect yeah. it. So it's prior proper uh, preparation. You come back to get a puppy and say, right, I'm going to take him on his first walk. And you put him on leash and out you go. And he's terrible greeting people, terrible greeting dogs. And he comes back pulling on leash. No, you should have trained your dog at home, you know, and troubleshoot it before you, you went out on the street. Um, You're getting very yes. good with your finger like this. I don't know what yeah, it means. Up. Yeah. We could talk all day about each one of you, but we want to get to everybody's questions. Easily. Holly is a wonderful trainer, and she is a very effective trainer, and that's why I chose her. I'm so glad she did a presentation and the presentation that she did. So super sits that Ian says, um, and you know, and following Holly's advice will work beautifully. Just you know, yes, I love that you said pull things back, pull it back. It's not too late. Who's next? Is it okay if I pick up my out of control rescue dog to comfort her when she's reacting to seeing other dogs on our walk? We believe she was bitten on the mouth and we were working on this issue. Um, I'm going to assume that this is a dog that is small enough to be picked up. Um, and however, um, and this is general, um, this is general advice that do not know your, your little dog. Um, Picking up makes things worse, not better. You've just taken away all agency. I mean, comforting her is one thing, making her feel secure, rewarding her for coming back to you, giving her, empowering her by giving her an opportunity to move away, all the things we've already talked about will work better than picking her up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that restraint, first of all, it can make her a target. With certain dogs and certain breed types, that is picking up your, your little dog is, is going to make them look like a toy and it's going to make them more of a target and you're restraining her, whether you're trying to comfort her or not, um, it makes dogs more defensive very, very, very often. So, you know, if she's seeing dogs on walks and not feeling comfortable, I would try to, um, you know, give some more space between you and, and the other dogs and, um, and make sure that you watch the presentations today that were, that were, um, that we know that we hosted today because they will also help you a lot with this. But I, I don't recommend picking up in most scenarios. Ian, do you have a feeling well, about this the dog being picked up? Between operant conditioning and classical conditioning, that when your dog's upset, we want to comfort it. I mean, this is natural. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to unintentionally train it. So if you just pick up your dog, and oh, it's okay, it's okay. You are now unintentionally increasing the frequency and sometimes intensity of its reactivity. So if you do that, and I do that, and, and the one we mentioned it yesterday, comforting puppies their first night, you know, away from the kennel and their mum. If you are offering comfort, you are also reinforcing whatever the dog is doing at that point, whether it's screaming, barking, crying, or what. Now, we can get around this by operantly conditioning and classically conditioning at the same time. And you can work this out yourself in the quadrant. Each has binary feedback. What you do when the stimulus is present, absent what you do for desirable behavior undesirable behavior so put a tick for praise and zero for ignore and what you'll find is 
if you pick it up and it's screaming, it's okay to say, it's okay now. It's just another dog, for God's sake, as long as when it stops fighting, screaming, and barking, you praise it more. So this, between low-level comfort and high-level praise, because the stimulus is still present, but your dog acting, you know, is that that's the operant component, okay? So we have to learn to get away from this pure sort of single binary thing, you know, reward versus, heaven forbid, punishment. And we have to give a much more rich feedback. I like ongoing analog, uh, simultaneous operant and classical conditioning. I, I talk to my dogs all the time in terms of feedback because not only do I want them to learn what is desirable, what's not desirable, but when the behavior is desirable or appropriate, how good it is. Zero to a hundred. You know, you're never going to do that, say, with one bit of kibble or one click and one treat. We've, we've got to really improve the feedback we have the dogs and offer guidance by way of talking them through it. Yes, excellent. All right, next question, please. Uh, this question is from no one. Uh, let's see, you often see aversive and balanced trainers, say uh, reward, positive reinforcement trainers can't deal with serious euthanasia risk aggression. I don't agree, but is, has, but I don't agree, but, but positive reinforcement isn't as visible here. Thoughts? Sources, videos that show otherwise. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's a little bit. It's a good question. It's a good topic, but it's a little bit off off topic. Um, no, of course that's not true. Um, if they're not as visible, I don't know. I I, I don't. I mean, I, I guess it just depends on where where you're where you're getting your social media. You know, I mean, I know lots and lots of very effective um you know positive reinforcement trainers that have dealt with serious risks risks of an aggression issues i live with uh arani and i got him because of the the dangerous you know i mean i, I don't know I, I think it just depends on where you where you look and people complain about each other all the time i don't think it's you know it's true i know it's not true and i don't think it's worth paying attention to um but that's a topic for another day. Next question. Can you talk about Holly's comment that all dog interactions should be done off leash and never on leash? Doesn't this present a problem in many cases? Well, I'm gonna start by saying, um, I, I mean, I, I, I know where Holly's coming from with that for sure. And Ian just kind of said the same thing a minute ago, off leash, if possible is ideal. Um, but not always, it's not always safe to do so. Um, I, I, I stay away from always and never. You know, you, you, you try to meet the situation with the best possibilities that you can. Um, we can get into why Ian and Holly are saying that in a minute, but also you have other things to consider. So for instance, with Luca, the, the wild lab, who's being friendly, um, you know, at 15 months, if you meet another friendly wild lab, now you've got the blind leading the blind as far as like who's in control of the situation that, you know, if they're off leash at a park, what kind of park is it? Is there a street nearby? Is there a bicycle path nearby where they're going to maybe, you know, slam into somebody or run across their path and, and cause a bike accident? Ask me how I know that or that can happen. Um, you know, are, are the dogs off leash reliable? Are you worried about a fight? Are you able to control your dog verbally? You know, there's a lot more to it. Um, if it's two dogs that you're trying to introduce, ideally, um, after a little parallel walk or something, you know, to see if they get along where they don't necessarily sniff and meet, they can be on leash next to each other. And after they're used to being around each other, then ideally you're in a safe, confined place, whether it's a yard or someone's house or, you know, a, a fenced area, then sure. But of course, it's not always and it's never, never. Right. So um, when possible, the dogs, dogs speak with their um, not with their words so much, although they can growl and bark. But um, 
proximity and body language are really important to them. And if they don't feel they have control over their proximity to a dog, or they can't get away, or, or, or approach in some cases, which makes them more frustrated, it's like us having, you know, like our hands tied behind our back and our, and our mouths covered, right? They can't communicate the way that they want to. And that's also another reason why picking them up and, and holding them can be a problem. It makes them more defensive. They don't feel in control of the situation. So when possible, but of course you have to look into whether it's safe to take your dog off leash um, in the scenario and, and can you get your dog back? Because honestly, more dogs get in trouble, not by fighting when they're off leash, uh, but when they're rambunctious teens who are not trained at all well enough in a recall or, or at an age where they can make responsible decisions. And they end up running in these big circles and chase, 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 chase. And, you know, like I said, they're knocking down cyclists. They're running into the street. You know, problems like that can occur. Um, long lines that you can drop are a nice option, too. Um, but they can get tangled. You have to be going to be good at that. So when possible, yes, they should be done off leash. Um, or at least leashes need to be loose and, you know, and not tangled. So, you know. There are problems and, you know, there are complications whether your dog is on leash or off leash. Um, next question. On the receiving end of reactivity, what can I do when my dog is being attacked? The dog grabs her throat and shakes her. Oh, my goodness. Well, hopefully that never happens. If someone grabs her throat and shakes her. Um, yeah, hopefully that hasn't happened to you. Um, if you're... Ian, do you want to talk about what to do defensively? I have some ideas, but you've been quiet for a while. So. A dog. Well, I would scream blue murder and I would go after the dog. But, um, you know, this is an emergency. Nothing that you can do is right. But I would certainly sacrifice myself if the dog is, you know, picked up and shook. I mean, you know, it's going to break its neck before we know it. If they're medium-sized dogs, though, and they're just grabbing the neck and doing the normal, you know, heavy duty play fighting, that's different. But I, to see this, to visualize it, I thought my dog were at all at risk. I would go ballistic so that if it went south, we change this from a dog dog event into a dog biting a person, and that attacking dog is now history. It becomes well, a, yes. problem, but a legal problem. Well, but again, if you do reach in, you know, dogs are hardier than humans and their skin is often very loose. You know, even in these little dogs, my little terriers have all this extra skin. They can take quite a shake. I know because they shake each other all the time and, and uh, you know, and they can they can handle a lot more. So, um, I mean, hopefully if your dog is equal size or larger than the dog that's shaking, that's one thing. But if it's smaller, you have, you know, you're in grave danger and definitely you scream and, and try to get the owner to, to help you. Um, this goes into defensive I did learn handling. Uh, the first time I ever did this, and the last time um, a dog grabbed Omaha and wouldn't let go, had him by the throat. And, um, you know, I shouted and shouted and did everything. It wouldn't let go. So Mimi had Omaha, you know, by the tail so he didn't lunge. I grabbed this dog. I cannot let it get go. And eventually I cracked my hand over its muzzle. And I broke my hand and I screamed blue murder at that instant, the dog let go. And what that taught me was, hey, you can beat on a dog, that doesn't do it. But when you scream yeah. with real intensity in your voice or better still in the house, you grab a table and you shake it like earthquake, earthquake, earthquake. And boom, the dog spook and then instantly, there's a good boy, come here, yeah, chill down. Listen. This is hard. It was a big dog, Ian. It was a Turkish mountain dog, Malawan mix, that attacked the dog. So this is scary stuff. Do not put your hands in. Do not hit a dog. It isn't going to work. Do not kick a dog. It isn't going to work. Do not stick your limbs in. It is only going to get you possibly potentially severed nerves and, and things like that. Um, that's a terrible situation. If you're near water and you can get the dog's head underwater, I've done that before um, at the beach. Um, they will let go if they can't breathe. Um, but this is a whole another defensive handling thing. I, that's horrible that that happened. I hope your dog is okay. Um, making noise, trying to be startling, sometimes sounding a sort of like the owner most probably yelled at them is can work. But mm, if they're in that instinctual grab and shake, um, you you may need to have something like you know 
a, a burnt stick or a spray that, you know, like a, a spray. You might want to carry like a pepper spray or something. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into this in a, in, a, in a forum because it's a serious topic and there's plenty. Um, it's, it should be its own, it should be its own course, defensive handling. And I do think that there are some courses out there like that because um, it's very dangerous for us to give you advice. Um, you know, as novice handlers in many cases, or just put advice out there. Um, oh my goodness. I think yesterday, you know, when we were talking about the umbrella, you know, for people who like tools, I find one of the most useful, effective, and safest of tools um, to have if you're a jogger and afraid of a dog attacking you, or you're walking a little dog and afraid that to be attacked is a scarf and you tie a knot in the end and it just hangs around your shoulder like this and you just flick it at the dog's face. You don't, you're not trying to hurt it. You flick it and often they grab it like that. Then you tug like mad and try and get to safety, like jump in the car, shut the yeah. door on it. Yeah, um, really good. Um, you've talked about having a sacrifice, like having like, like a shirt or yeah. a jacket or a scarf. I love that, you know. Um, and an umbrella yeah. could work to a degree, but then you can't, they're not going to tug and grab it. But, but then popping an umbrella might help it. But if they're already attached, I think you're right. Try to get them to grab something else. Um, anyway, this is, it's an intense thing. I'm very sorry that happened, but I don't think it's um, something that I can. I Let's can, take another question. In, 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 yeah. Not so no, extreme. I'm so sorry, Caitlin. Okay, what's next? Hoping for help with a reactive rescue, Roddy. He's five years old. I said he, I don't know if he is or not. Um, he, um, sweet in the house, positive commands work, but when unexpected attacks on people, but when unexpected attacks or people or wildlife present, it's hard to hold on and control. Um, yeah, Rodney's are really strong. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it sounds like he's reacting to, he or she's reacting to the environment. Um, people or wildlife chasing, barking, lunging. Um, I mean, management is going to be key here. You probably want a double attached harness slash head collar. You want to desensitize to a head collar. You might want to, de you probably would absolutely should desensitize to a muzzle and get the, you're already used to wearing a, a muzzle while you work on all the basic training and attentive, attentiveness and training that um, is presented throughout this, these four days. There's a lot of techniques you can use but first you've got to have physical control, right? So um, muzzle training, nice big basket muzzle training, um, you know, a dual uh, attachment with a leash and a head collar so that you have a little more leverage, but you've got to get your dog used to that and um, in work in less distracting environments while you really work on getting attention and some obedience going before you. Um, move forward. And then when you are out in the world, stay in one place and work, you stay in one place while things go by and you're walking through the environment. There's so many surprises and it's overstimulating for the dog. And also we tend to tune out. Even if we're not tuning out, you, you, you can get surprised when you're walking. Whereas if you're standing off to the side, um, you are, you're an observer of the world versus being a part of it. And that helps a lot when you're starting out with this kind of stuff. I, just went through this with my Roddy um, a couple of years ago when I got him. The year of, well, he's only a year old, but he's huge and very practiced and has bitten and such. And we've got him to the point where he just now walks sweetly. Uh, he is sweet in the house. He's also now um, calm on walks, but I still won't have people approach him, strangers approach him um, out, and, out and about in the world. But he can control himself now. It's just, that's just training. Um, so next question. Sorry, Ian, I'm just moving along with that one. You take this one. After my reactive dog sees another dog in the specific area, down the street to the right, the house behind us, et cetera, she will, oh, okay. So whenever, once, once her dog, her reactive dog has seen a dog somewhere, she's looking on an alert, high alert, looking for that, that dog again when they go past. You know, so if there was ever a dog behind that fence or ever a dog around that corner, now she's going in high alert when they get to that area. What do you say to that, to that, to that, Ian? Phoenix did that probably for six years. It was a dog that I, I was walking her at 2 a.m. just because that's, you know, I'm not one of these people who walk the dog when no other dogs are around. And this shepherd came around the corner and bit her and um, 
Pierce the humorous. <laughs> and um, every day we walked and lived down on the block. And it was a house that had a big balcony. And every day we walked past there, probably till the day she died, she looked up at that balcony like this all the way when she walked by. Um, it was no harm, you know. And so, yeah, dogs remember stuff like that. Like if you were mugged on a certain street corner, you'd, you'd think about it every time you walked by. And if you got good sense, cross the street. Um, if, on the other hand, you don't like the dog doing this, then say, hey, watch me focus or all of that is encompassed in the single instruction heel it doesn't mean just have your shoulder by my knee move at the same speed as me turn when i turn and sit when i stop it also means and look at me why because then that stimulus blocking the dog is not looking at anything else if it's looking at you um so you know basic commands like sit watch heel take care of most of these behaviors but what we have is severe response reliability drift as we move from our kitchen to other areas like a sidewalk or a dog park and i think what dog training desperately needs is to move back to regular quantification because everyone every case i see they have an incredibly inflated opinion of their control over the dog <laughs> Well, if you've seen any of my workshops, you see me choose eight arch dogs, best dogs in the country, and I put them through a simple test. And what we find is they can't even sit on a verbal cue when you make minor changes to the situation. And so I think we have to really troubleshoot where we train by integrating a simple sit into walk, sniffing and play, and then go play, go sniff. Let's go so that it's heavily reinforced by life rewards. So it becomes the most reliable word you have because it's such a useful command. All right. I have, I, I, so you can obedience your way out of this in most cases, like Ian says, um, it does take up in your obedience, Arista here. Um, I would say like, what's happening is anticipation and like, and, and completely understandably, as Ian said, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard not to have a reaction like that. I would also, you know, I would add um, to the toolbox there, you know, changing the emotional response to that corner or that fence line or that block of your of your walk um, by stopping when you get there. And, you know, hopefully there isn't a dog there every time, but even if there is, probably we're having playing at my feet, um, take out your toy, bring your tug toy, get a game going that you've already established at home and in the backyard and in front of your house, some kind of game, whether it's weave through my legs, or let's tug, 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 or let's do air catch with the treats for a second, or a celebration of sorts, and do your fun, happy celebration thing at these places where they're uncomfortable, or where your dog is uncomfortable, and change that to a happy spot. So, and then also work on your obedience and make sure that you can keep your dog under control even when they're maybe a little bit, um, worried um that said you know the idea is to have them not be worried so um you know i it, it's understandable and if it's something that happens repeatedly then you know it, the anticipation is there it's going to build over time so you know maybe change your route for a little while build up your routines both obedience and fun routines and then go back but maybe don't go past it just go towards it work on your stuff and then move away so that it's not always getting it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, it's getting worse, it's getting worse. Oh, it's not it's scary or it's annoying or it's frustrating. I hate that dog or whatever it may be. All right, I think next the question. Big problem there, though, that reactivity blocks classical conditioning. People can't do it in the moment. And so what we need to do, again, is come down the non-threatening end of the spectrum. And so you walk and every 25 yards, you do the jolly routine. You just dance a jig with your dog, back up, come here, give us a hug. Every 25 yards, each one is in a different scenario, which is preparing you for more and more unusual or difficult scenarios until eventually now you can do that at a point where the dog would be reactive. Otherwise, if you don't do it in other situations and you only do it when the dog is reactive, what you're doing is uh -huh. obviously getting the reaction and highlighting it. And, and so this is um, what I, I think is so important 
is troubleshooting your training. You repeat it when things are normal. You don't wait, like, you know, let's think beforehand before we jump off a cliff, how we're going to negotiate the air and land. Don't start thinking about it. So I would put on a parachute, you know. I wouldn't start thinking about it when I'm 10 feet from impact to the ground. But that's what we do with our dogs. No preparation for what to do in emergencies. So, of course, it doesn't work in an emergency. And, and, and do the, I tell you, this would make me the happiest when I'm being pushed around in a wheelchair. If I saw a man coming down the street with his German shepherd walking like this, and then every 25 yards he stopped and went, doobie dooby doo, soup, you give us a hug, twirl, twirl, back up, high five, and then heel on again, fuss. That would make me really happy. But that dog would be less likely to be reactive because he's getting so tuned in to his owner. I think we need a video of you doing that. I'd love to see that. We should put that up on the site. That I love it. Cool. All right. You should have filmed me on the I was walking Duke. Stop it. Stop it. Duke. All right. Let's see. How do we break possession aggression? We have been trying to break possession aggression for nearly 12 years with our German Shepherd. Uh, we've worked with trainers. At this point, do we just give up? Oh, are you talking about um, possession as in uh, like resource guarding? Um, grabbing something and, and then growling and snapping at you once they have it. I mean, German Shepherds are definitely prone to possession. Um, you know, I mean, trading objects is the way to go with that, teaching your dog to trade for something equal or better value. And you can do that with toys. You can do that with food. You know, we do that even in bite work with toys, right? And you want to bite this thing, I want you to bite this thing. And then we're going to go back and bite that thing. And then you're going to come back and bite this thing. And then eventually we're going to call it a different word, which is end the game. And then I'm going to reward you for ending the game, but with food. You know, so um, I, I don't know. I'm guessing it's probably with, and is it towards dogs or is it towards people? Um, it's a little more challenging if it's with dogs. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, if they're guarding their, their food or bones from other dogs, I don't know if this is a multi-dog household or um, I don't have really enough information there to to make a, oh, toys, it's toys. Okay, oh, then that'll be fun. You can do that. You can switch up with toys. Um, you know, yeah, so you need you need to start with low value toys first. And um, oh, I wish we had a presentation on this somewhere. Um, we can do that someday. Next time, uh, you... You know, you work, you, you work with low-level things. You keep possession of one hand. You don't give it up or you have a, a rope tied to it or a leash tied around it or something so you don't lose it and the dog doesn't just get to run away. And you trade and you teach a trading game. And actually, this is something that, you know, that, um, sh that Shade from yesterday does a lot of. You know, it's switching, switch toys. So it's not the end of something. It's just switching it up. And then in the switch, they learn to open their mouth and release to get something else. Um, you can also sometimes do this with catch. I had one Malawi used catch. She would have something and she wouldn't let go. She wouldn't let go. She wouldn't let go. Just loved it. Just, you know, had to have, had to possess, had to hold the thing. So outside of that, I taught catch with really fun treats. I'd throw them in the air. And she got to the point where I'd say catch and she'd open her mouth, you know, and then you can add it to the toy game. Um, that's a kind of a quick rundown, but this can be a fun thing to work on and, um, you know, it, it, and you, you just switch it around, literally, you know, you don't think of it as, um, I'm going to take something from you. I'm going to switch or I'm going to trade. And, you know, at, the, at, at 12 years old, you can always trade. There's always something. Why fight at this point? Say, you've got that thing, but would you like to catch this hot dog, whatever it may be. And then when they catch the hot dog, you can take the other thing and, you know, you can do some repetitions or not. Um, Trade, always trade, or almost always trade, is what I would do. Ian, anything for that? Well, yeah, it's the basic, you're going to teach off, take it, thank you. So the dog learns the token routine that we're not losing this forever, we're just trading it for something better, and then we get it back again. We always start with objects of low value, so the dog doesn't even want to take it. So the big thing now is to get the dog to take this, say, toilet roll or rock or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and we're trying to encourage it by going off, off, 
off and take it. Good dog. Thank you. Well, it just drops it in your hand because it never wanted it in the first place. So then we give it three two. And we do. As you up the level of the value of the object, it's easy for the dog to take it now, but he's less inclined to give it up. But he's just learned the token system that when he let drop this in your hand, you, the idiot, will exchange it for four liver treats. And that's no fair exchange. This is a clod of dirt or a stick. You give him four treats and then you give him the object back again. You know, you're the worst dog on the planet. So that's it. Off take it. Thank you. Starting with low valued objects, working up to high value objects. Yeah, um, and someone is um, <clears throat> talking about this, uh, commenting on this, what we're talking about. Throwing to increase the power of food is very valuable. You can take food and make it a toy and make it <clears throat> something that you play with. So, yes, um, sometimes they're going to always want the item. I mean, sometimes they're more foodie, sometimes they're more into toys and possessing something smushy. Throwing food, teaching them to catch, teaching them to chase it um, does is, is useful in so many ways. Okay, we are almost out of time. Let's see if we can get two more in by doing um, concise answers. Let's see, Myrna, I have a bull terrier Steffi mix who self harms when left alone or when he meets new people. We have him wear a onesie, socks and a cone if we have to leave him alone. Um, hey, hey, hold on, I got Okay, yeah, when self harms. So when he meets new people, um, I mean, that sounds like stress. This sounds like a job for Ness Jones with her separation anxiety work. And she does have a presentation coming up and that will be very helpful to you. But um, that's, that's not a quick answer. Um, it sounds like you've got some anxiety and stress happening there. And I would highly recommend reaching out to Ness and watching her presentation. Um, although I have to say the idea of a terrier in a onesie with socks is, is very cute, but the cone is, is, is a bit much. I think this dog is not comfortable being left alone and has anxiety. So that's something that Ness can, that Ness can handle. Next one, YouTube user, my six month old Husky GSD loves to meet people and dogs so much she pees either indoors, outdoors, home or on a walk. I will employ, be employing what Holly taught to de-escalate in meetings. Is that a self-reinforcing behavior? Um, well, you can say that when someone pees, anyone, when one pees, oh, there's a relief to it. And in some cases, that's true. This is just simply probably um, a physiological response to excitement. And you wanna, it's not self-reinforcing in this case, yeah, right? Yeah, I can just, do this really quickly. Uh, this is, I, I love this problem because it's the thing, the problem that teaches people you can't just wail on the dog and punish it. On the other hand, you can't reassure it because that would reinforce the peeing. The only way out of this problem is rewarding the dog for not peeing when greeting. Ah, but he always pees. We've got to troubleshoot the greeting. So the first person who comes in, or it could be the owner coming home, they greet the dog while walking away from it. So the dog has to keep following them before the person touches them. They don't crowd it and then it you know, urinates on the floor. After that, when the dog has now got used to this person in the home and being touched by them, they then leave and come back again. By the third time they do this, the dog doesn't pee. So now we can praise and say, good. What a brave dog, you're holding your bladder. Oh, you are a grown up puppy. Here's a treat, here's a treat, here's a treat. So you've got to troubleshoot it till it doesn't happen, then repeat it a few more times with heavy praise and heavy food rewards. Um, I would say um, Holly's de escalation greetings is, is a great thing to do. And keeping calm greetings, giving your dog something to do, keeping people at a distance at first until. So sometimes the initial greeting is just too much. Often you'll also find that if you just like act really nonchalant and ignore, the, ignore your dog, then you have the person ignore your dog when they get there and then say hi once they're calm, that can help too. Um, there's something here I want to, I see a question that isn't on the screen, um, but I want to address really quickly. Um, it is from Kathy Delana. De De um, how do I get my GSD to stop stealing Kleenex shoes, etc.? He gets reactive when we try to create reactive, meaning he's guarding them or he is possessing them, which, Kathy, that answer 
that we just gave for the other guarding GSD will also apply to you. However, I'd like to add one thing, and this is for everyone who has a puppy or a dog that likes to steal things and be, because either they want to possess them, they become high value because you chase them around or because they just love certain objects or types of things. Teach your dog to retrieve those things instead of going, hey, hey, no, don't have to, give me that, give me that. Get over here, chasing them around or ah, making a thing of it. Say, oh, look what you've got. What a good dog. What a good dog. Come here, bring it in. And, and, and again, trade. It Thank starts you. with the trade. Oh, look what I have. Look what I have over here. This is this, no, this is not Kleenex. Let's pretend this is a treat bag. Oh, I'm going to get the treat out. Oh, my God. Good dog. Look at you, clever dog. You picked up my socks. What a good dog. And then you can toss the treat down or have them do their catch. They drop the thing. You toss a few more treats. You pick up the thing and you don't make a big deal of it. I have resolved so many stealing uh, stealing creatures and possessive creatures that way. It's don't make a thing of it. Make a thing of, of the taking and don't chase them. Teach them to come to you. It gets to the point where maybe they start actually retrieving socks. I have one dog that does do this. This little dog that was very viciously guardy and definitely loved to steal socks and everything. And now he would pick up a sock, start over to me and put it down, say, look what I found. And, you know, and it's, it's just, you can turn that into a joyful thing. Okay. And in the meantime, um, on the toilet or keep them in drawers, you know, until you've trained your dog. Yes. I mean, yes. And I know sometimes in households with teenagers or children, that can be difficult. I mean, management is also a key but the, the general idea in all these kind of possession and stealing things is, A, partially management, keeping your dog safe, but also just teaching them to love to bring things to you and don't put a lot of energy around. They shouldn't have that. Um, do teach and leave it, take it off, because sometimes you can pick up something that is dangerous for them. Um, are you doing a Perrier commercial? I'm doing a Perrier uh, commercial. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are not sponsored by Perrier yet. Um, so, oh, friendly company. Um, you know, teaching them to trade is invaluable and don't have it in your mind that, well, he's getting something on, on, off on me because, you know, I'm giving him, she's stealing, I'm giving him something or he's getting my attention. It doesn't matter. You'll find that this de-escalates the whole thing. Everyone here is getting antsy. Um, it is four o'clock. Let's just, let's just, um, do one more and then we're out. All right, so one more. Let's make it a nice one. How do I keep my border collie mix from being bored in a rural setting? <laughs> Get sheep. <laughs> yeah. How do border collie mix be bored in a rural setting? That's a no-brainer. <laughs> Get sheep. That's what I did. I don't, have, I don't even have a border collie. Um, no, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about maybe there aren't enough dog friends around. Right, no, I think they it. mean from being bored in an urban setting. It has to be. What border collie could be bored um, in a rural setting? I mean, there's pigeons, there's squirrels, which are like yeah, mini sheep. I'm not sure if you, yeah, did you mean urban? That doesn't make sense, though. If you mean rural, then I'm assuming your border collie doesn't have friends. Um, yeah, then dance with it, play games with it. Bring his dog social group party. over for a party <laughs> twice a week. So here's the thing. If your dog is bored, you have to up the ante. It doesn't matter whether they're rural, whether they're in the city. Um, as Nomad Thief Dog Trainer says, bring to London. There's plenty of bored border collies in Kensington Gardens, too. Um, they need or you teach you have the dog to dog. enjoy being bored, you know, feeding him only tongs, you know, so it's less, you know, Not crucified food for it. Toys. Food stuffed rubber toys of any brand. Um, you can also use, um, you know, slow feeder. I mean, project feeding is great, but also, um, yeah, like you need, you need your dog needs an activity. I have a, um, one of my working turns is less bite work oriented and he loves to herd things and chase things. And, um, we play our own version of like soccer slash sheep herding with balls. You know, and I've taught him to hit goals. Like, you just make up games. So he has to re get the balls between the goals, or he's got to collect the balls and put them here. Tree or ball. collect your toys, put them away. They're like, yeah, a tree ball. They like to, um, cl I mean, find an agility club or just teach some tricks. There's some, um, your dog probably just needs more mental stimulation. And if it's a rural setting, then you, you know, you can 
you can set up, you know, different big balls and, and have them roll them around and organize them and, and things like that. And, but regardless, if your dog is bored, um, if they don't need hours and hours and hours of activity. They do need targeted activity that is mental stimulation regularly. And, you know, scent work would be an awesome thing, whether your dog is rural or, um, or urban. Scent work you can do in your home, you can do in your apartment, you can do on the streets, you can do in the country gardens, uh, tracking, tracking if you are in a rural setting, your dog's nose working. That's what I would recommend. All right, I think we, we did, I think better today being faster. I mean, it's hard because we do want to, you know, obviously give everybody our attention. This is not, um, this is a, you know, a, a Q and A, but it is not a, um, a stand in for training with the trainer or, you know, um, when you're working with the trainer in a, in a program, these are tips to help you and get your, your brain going and the juices flowing. But I do recommend working with the trainer and watching all of the brilliant presentations that we have all week long. So thrilled with the people that presenting this time and uh, we're having, we're having, we're having a blast. Thank you for tuning in. And again, thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, we've got Doggy Dan, we've got Ness Jones and Polly Pets and the Healing Vet. Thank you all for allowing us to do this, this wonderful summit by supporting us. I'm, and I'm really look forward thrilled. tomorrow to Ness Jones, Andrea Arden and Doggy Dan. Yeah, it's going to be another fun day. So thank you for tuning in, everybody. Um, I feel we'll like see I you <laughs> Sure. Um, oh, now, oh yes, there is. There was a title um, mix-up for Renee Rhodes' talk. Um, I don't know if it's been uh, fixed or not. Probably has, but um, her her talk was brilliant. But it was about. Um, it was not about. What, what, what did it say? It said leash. Out of control. Leash, leash, on leash, talking, leash. Lunching, growling, and off yeah. leash. Yeah. No. <laughs> We did not talk about that. Renee's lovely talk on day one was about um, managing your dog in the household. If they're being unruly, whether it's barking at windows or tearing things up and, and things like that. So, um, but we do have other people speaking today that we're handling things like uh, unleash stuff. And Ian, um, you know, we have a whole bunch of material on that as well in on our bundle. So um, thank you all, everybody. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. I'm not sure. And thank you, Ian. Lovely to see you again. And thank you, Kelly. Here good also. See you. Bye. Bye, bye. And uh, bye, bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>